microphone on, please. Oh, yes, indeed. City, and a couple of us wanted to go and thank him personally, but he wasn't home. So we found out nobody particularly liked Johnson in Johnson City because he's so discerning. The division surgeon said, Doc, you're a big guy, I don't want you walking around, so we'll put you in armored cavalry. And that's how I got to be a Buffalo soldier, first in the 10th Cavalry. And I was drafted on July 1st. said, my second year, I was in Fort Mitchell, Virginia. At that time, the truck driver center of the Army. And I got interested in the Civil War because there was nothing to do after 10 o'clock football except run around and see all the Confederate statues in the week. I wonder if they're still there. Yeah, Probably not. Uh, occasionally got to Richmond. Sadly. And I remember, if you've ever been to the Confederate Museum in Richmond, you can go through it for two hours all body servants and things like that. And in, in addition to that, you have no idea who won or lost the Civil War from going through the museum. So I got interested when I uh, moved from Anchorage, Alaska, where I did my practice, to San Antonio, New Mexico. I volunteered to Pecos National Historic Park, which <coughs> and behold had received the Battle of Gloria Pass. And so one thing led to another, and I talked on Civil War stuff probably about I love town <coughs> and here I am. Okay, surgery. Uh, the treatment of Civil War soldiers was basically the, the carry home line is it was <laughs> had to know more about the of 750,000 deaths, probably at least 100,000 less. Okay, medicine at that time was evolving. And it was still at the end of heroic medicine. Heroic medicine was heroic because you had to do something. The idea of medicine had to change later. You had to do things that made you afraid to go to the doctor. That was all part of a mystique that made you think things were getting done. Okay. If your upper body was in trouble, you had hip attack. Some of you remember your grandma had hip attack on the back shelf. <laughs> medicine cabinet uh, to make you vomit because if stuff was wrong you really had to vomit it out. If stuff was wrong with dysentery you had to really get diarrhea to wash all that stuff out. And that was heroic medicine. It was also bloodletting. Bloodletting went out when somebody realized bleeding, a uh, debilitated bleeding soldier probably doesn't make all that much sense. However, after a lot of research and a lot of years, I found out there really were two reasons for bloodletting, believe it or not. The first is if you bled early and bled a lot, you might change the course of pneumonia. And that was documented. The second reason was all bleeding stops if you lose enough blood. <laughs> and the idea is if you have a high blood pressure, of course you healthy. If I take enough blood away from you, you'll stop bleeding. And then I can sew up your wound or do whatever I want to do. Uh, they even bled mothers that are having eclampsia. That's where your blood pressure goes out of whack just before childbirth. And if you bleed enough, 
First of all, you lose oxygen carrying capacity for the baby. But second, the mother's blood pressure goes down. So there are sort of enough reasons for <coughs> excuse me. There are enough reasons to, to bleed. Um, Bloodletting was probably responsible for more deaths than not, even though I haven't read of any deaths. You could, you could bleed, incidentally, here it is. This is a bloodletting knife. I've seen them with 12 blades. I don't know if you use them one at a time or if you use all 12. <laughs> the handle is brass made by a blacksmith. It's pretty clever. I've tried for years to figure out how you bend all that from one piece of brass, but they did. The blades are nice and dull, so they've been used. <laughs> and you didn't cut, you found a vein like that one. You didn't cut that way. You cut up and down because it made a bigger hole, and you bled quicker. The idea was to bleed a pint or two at a time. You can do that every other day for three shots. Uh, I didn't really read about anybody dying, but you sure felt tired and had to be in bed for a week or two. You probably know that's how George Washington died. He got bled about a gallon and purged and puked another half a gallon, and he died anyway, with, even with the best medicine of the day. Okay, bloodletting got a little more sophisticated after a while. When I lived in Santa Fe, they still did cupping. They probably still do. You take what looks like a, a reinforced shot glass, put a flame inside, drive out the oxygen, put it somewhere that you need, you need to get the blood out of, cut across it with a fleam. This is the only tortoise shell thing I've ever owned, made in Sheffield, England, and it's nickel plated. You could draw off two ounces at a time, I've seen cupping pictures where you had dozens of scars from dozens of applications. The cups come even bigger. Gwyneth Paltrow supposedly cures her migraine by bloodletting, which A proves there might be something in her head, which I don't know. <laughs> and you didn't, you didn't make the cross cuts because you couldn't afford to put a scar on Gwyneth Paltrow's body. So if you don't make the cross cuts, that's dry cupping, and supposedly it still draws the blood away. Okay. After a while, I got even more sophisticated. This is called the scarificator. And if you look closely, there's, if I get it going, there's a dozen razor blades in there. You set it like a gun uh, lock, put it someplace, release the trigger, and voila, you generally bleed about two ounces. After that, to get, it, to get it going, you could put a leech on top. Leeches, as I'm sure you learned in high school, inject an anticoagulant and a bleeding agent, and they each bleed two ounces at a time. In Santa Fe, people wondered if you recycle the leeches. Uh, I said, no, we would squash them on the wall. <laughs> I used leeches when I was an intern at Bellevue in New York which has a reputation far exceeding its physical capacity. And a typical thing is if you're trying to sew an ear back, uh, you can sew the arteries because they have a strength to them in a wall and you can take a stitch. The veins can't be sewed, so it would swell up. You put three leeches, they each suck up their two ounces, and you squash them on the wall. <laughs> and, and after a while, the nature hooks up the veins and things start to work. So that's bloodletting. There are still places that do it. Uh, third world, third world countries and stuff like that. Okay, so, so much for bloodletting. Bleed, purge, and puke was the heroic medicine mantra. I told you about the puking and I told you about the diarrhea stuff. <laughs> now we happily move along. I'm thinking, yeah, almost to the surgery part which is the interesting stuff. That's a stethoscope. I've always wondered why I didn't call it a stethophone. Because you listen, you don't look. This one I think is authentic, period. And you listen that way. The rationale was a gentleman never would put his ear to a lady's chest. 
and so you had something in between. Uh, it doesn't make coffee and it doesn't work on the computer like today's telescopes, but it was pretty good for the day. <coughs> okay, moving right along, what do we have more? The spark of the neurosurgery of the day. If you happen to get hit on the head, you form a hematoma, you could, which is blood underneath the bone of your skull. Uh, if it forms underneath the dura, which is the covering of the brain, uh, you're in trouble. If it forms above the dura, you can get it out. You take a trephid, which is like the old cork borer you had in high school, you dig a hole. Uh, when I was an intern, you dug four holes and put them together with a saw. And back in the day, you did one hole. If the blood was high enough in the brain, it pushed it out and you got better until it got infected. If it happened to be in the brain, it pushed the brain out and you didn't do quite as well. <laughs> Although, I have read where some surgeons, if the brain got pushed out, you just scraped it off, sewed it up, and sooner or later, you know, like 10,000 monkeys typing Shakespeare, sooner or later somebody got better from having their brain scraped and their wound closed. That's trephining. It's an old movie now, but you remember Master and Commander? Where Doc, what was his name? Matterman? I don't know. He dug a hole in the old in the old sailor's head and he got better, sort of. Uh, so much for trephining. <laughs> now, as part of obstetrics and gynecology, which actually got started before the Civil War, at Civil War time they actually had obstetrics as a specialty. It was such a specialty that it included the first two years of the baby's life. And pediatrics didn't get going for quite a while after that. The idea was the child was a baby till two and then was an adult, and that's how they got treated. And if, you know, if 10 grams of some medicine is good for an adult, two grams is good for a baby. And you know, it was just like everything else, people died, but you had to start somewhere and make progress. <coughs> Anybody remember what a pessary is? Come on, enough of you guys are as old as I am, which you know pessaries. If you have 10 or 20 kids and you're working in the fields, the female organs kind of fall down. And this, because the surgery was dangerous in the day, this is what you would push everything back in and put this in and it would be a support. It's German, porcelain on an iron core. And the interesting thing is, one of these is model one and one of these is model 85. So some clever German thought of 85 ways to do this and hold the uterus up, which seems like what a clever German doctor would think of. Okay, now we get to the real stuff, which of course is surgery, since I'm a surgeon, or was a scant 20 some odd years ago. And again, they had anesthesia. One of the popular myths is that they put in bullets. If you think about it, would you like to go to sleep with a little hunk of lead in the back of your throat? No. That can, you know, stop your respiration and you might die that way, when there are so many other good ways to die. <laughs> <laughs> and they might occasionally bite on a block of wood or a piece of leather. Also, what happens is they didn't use alcohol, which was too precious, and they didn't use alcohol to put you to sleep, although they probably did sometimes. Basically, they had anesthesia. Chloroform and ether had been around for a couple of decades. Has anybody ever had ether? Do you remember every single minute of it? I do. Everybody Afterward. Never been, yeah. I've never been anybody that didn't remember having ether. Uh, when I was a kid and had my tonsils out, or was it my appendix, all I could think about while I was getting started was Brooklyn Dodgers running around the bases. And when I got up, all I could think about was vomiting. And somebody said, you can have all the ice cream you want. And they didn't tell you it tastes like a red hot poker. So you remember ether. Chloroform, well, ether explodes. So you wouldn't use that on the actual battlefield. You'd probably use that in the big hospitals. Uh, so before I forget, one of the biggest hospitals was Chimborazo, Confederate hospital around the outskirts of Richmond. We had eight to 12,000 beds, 
and a mortality of 10%. The key was you had to get there. If you got there, 10% mortality just ain't that bad, even today. And Chimborazo was big enough that they had their own garden, their own bakery, their own uh, dairy, and they could supply Richmond with food for a while. And the waste went down into the river, so the hospital is actually pretty good. Chimborazo, if you haven't looked it up yet, is the name of an Ecuadorian volcano. And for some reason, they named the hospital in Richmond after an Ecuadorian volcano. Uh, if you can figure out why, let me know. OK, so hospitals were good. Probably 25,000 beds <coughs> between Richmond and Washington in that big oval. And again, if it wasn't for sterility, it was OK. They ran out of doctors. When the war started, there were 123 doctors in, quote, the army. Three were fired for incompetence, Tw and 23, I think, went south, became Confederate doctors, and the war started that way. Within a year and a half, there were 15,000 well-trained doctors in both armies. I've seen their tests. I have no idea what the questions are, let alone the answers. And they had in the, the test, your first test was a 35% failure rate. And the second test you took also was a 35% failure rate. So the docs were pretty good uh, with the knowledge of the day. Again, for crossword puzzle fans, the only Confederate medical school that kept going during the war was in Richmond. At one time, they had three graduates. But they still kept going. OK, so you got your docs. The Navy was the choicest position for a doctor and generally had to wait for somebody to die to get a position as a Navy doctor. I guess it still happens, right? <coughs> uh, and that's the way it went. Then we get to amputations. Believe it or not, you read about amputations, how brutal they were. Actually, they were the best operation there was, saved the most lives, and they should have done more instead of fewer of them. The reason for that is if you get shot with a mini ball, which is an interesting structure in itself. It doesn't go fast enough to sterilize itself, like an AK-47 or an M-16. It drove in your uniform in a cavity in the muscle, and then it collapsed. You would do your amputation two inches above the broken part and have all this junk still in there, which caused secondary infection and more deaths. So they actually should have done more amputations and done them higher up. Uh, a little finger amputation had a more set mortality of 2%. I don't know how much the more, how high the mortality was for amputations in general, but if you had a shoulder, a hip, or a knee for some reason, it was over 90% death. If you did them within the first 24 hours before God knew it was broken, they didn't get infected generally. Postoperative care was take them by the tree and let them wake up and get them, you know, get them someplace. Uh, this is an amputation knife for upper thighs. Interesting part about this particular set, it was maybe a prototype because it's nickel plated, so it hasn't been <coughs> in 150 or 60 years. The handles are ebony, uh, which is kind of cool. They weren't sterilized, if they got dirty, you wipe them off on your sleeve. The docs with the most stiff, and they wore aprons, not white coats. The stiffer the coat, the more blood on it, the better the surgeon, <laughs> theoretically. The only time you can actually clean it is if you couldn't see the tip, and you might swish it in some water. At the end of the day, your orderly or private or whoever got stuck with the job would lay out this, the stuff, put a blanket on top, and be ready for the next day. My favorite battle was Shiloh, you might remember. Uh, 26,000 casualties, two-day battle, 34 doctors both sides. And they operated seven, seven up amputations an hour, each doc for two to three days in a row. It would be hard to be the one at 6 o'clock in the morning after the docs had been going all night. When they use this mill, at night they use lanterns or candles. During the day, you had the good old sun. P 
people operated outdoors, and which was fortunate because it blew the anesthetic away, and so there were very few anesthesia deaths. Something like 15,000 out of the countless millions of procedures done, which is good for today's world, too. Uh, they tended to sew up wounds that were dirty. We don't do that anymore. And that got the mortality rate up a little bit. Okay, what else? This particular set, 1864, did not have a bullet extractor, so each surgeon had to buy their own. You do what it looks like, you grab the bullet and pull it out, and sew it up. Uh, sooner or later, you'll wonder about this artificial eye, which the kids call a genuine fake eye. <laughs> Surprising how many kids were, wonder if you can see through it. <laughs> They're double layered, glass blown by a glass blower. The pupil is inset separately, and it is a big production. Sometimes you can get one with little red threads in it. If you were out drinking at night, you can match the bloodshot eye with the other one. You can get them with wider pupils if you work in the dark, narrower pupils if you work in the sunlight. And the last time I checked, there were fewer than 100 glass eye blowers left in the world. I guess now they're plastic and all that sort of thing. Okay, moving right along. Last year, incidentally, I had a knee replacement, a broken ankle, and a kidney removed all on the left side. So it's taken a while to get over. So that's why I'm hobbling and dropping things. Tooth key. Uh, dentistry has always been very popular with people. They've, I've never read where they figured out if you put cloves on the gums, it would make, any, would make things anesthetic. But it does. And they never did. This is a tooth <coughs> cleaner. You would put the hook over the top, give it a yank. <laughs> <laughs> the sound of taking a tooth out. <laughs> a third of the time the tooth would come out, and you might get better. A third of the time you'd break the top off. <laughs> and have to do root canal, which is probably why root canal is not as much fun as it once was. <laughs> and a third of the time, you break the jaw. Yeah. Dentistry sort of got started as a veterinary specialty. Of course, when you get down to it, horses, were, horses got to be more rare, if that's a phrase, than soldiers after a while, especially on the Union. Like when I was in medical school, they said, you can always find another medical student, but you can't find a good elevator operator. <laughs> so watch what you're doing. We did. OK, that's dentistry. <clears throat> These are endotracheal tubes. If your breathing is screwed up, you cut a hole in your windpipe. They didn't have those during George Washington's day, and George Washington essentially died of tonsillitis. His tonsils were big and they were met in the middle. There was a French doctor there who knew how to do a tracheotomy, but you don't do the first one in the United States on the president. <laughs> it's unclear how many lawyers were in the room anyway. <laughs> but that, that advanced alone. Ooh, what else we got? I'm stalling until we get to the questions. That's my favorite part. <laughs> this is a mini ball. Well, I don't know how many grams it weighs. It's rifled. When they got to use rifles instead of muskets, it can go through seven inches of wood at the two football fields length with some accuracy. As I said before, it didn't grow fast enough to sterilize itself. So if you didn't get it out, it got infected, and that was a problem. Getting toward the end, I'm warning you about the question period. $10,000 on a trip to Hawaii for anybody who knows what that is. <laughs> I don't. And world experts on old medical instruments, and there are such, don't know what it is either. 
It's got two handles, it's a chain. If it were sharp, it would be a saw, but it's not sharp. And it's important because it has its own compartment in the middle of the set. But nobody knows what it is. Uh, let's see, when we talked about amputations, this is a bone saw, perhaps we call saw bones, as you remember. Silly as it sounds, this hacksaw looking thing has a hole. Putting your finger in that hole actually makes it more comfortable. And if you're doing seven amputations an hour, you damn well need a little comfort here and there. It had interchangeable blades. Uh, hmm. Oh, this is a favorite. I'll show you the other favorite after. I don't know, do people still do late term abortions? They're pretty much not done. But this is what this was for. If you were a potential mommy and you're in labor for a week, you're getting weak and almost dying, it was permissible, if not mandatory, to put this in the birth canal, open the baby's brain, let all the goo come out and at least deliver the baby and save the mother. The idea being a mother could have another child and the baby would kill the mother because it couldn't get born. Another absolute favorite. Anybody have their tonsils? How'd you get away with that? When I was a kid, it was, oh, come on, get your tonsils out, bring your, bring your uncle, bring your kids, everybody will need it. And the way they would do it, when you think about it, you couldn't anesthetize a kid, because then they'd swallow the blood, get pneumonia, and not do too well. So you operated by surprise. Stop to be there. His surgeon would yank open the kid's mouth, crying, screaming, and all. You take one of these instruments, try to get the loop around the tonsil, which is, I can think, damn near impossible. Hold everything in place with the spike and chop off the tonsil. No way that I know of to stop the bleeding, but at least the kid doesn't aspirate and get pneumonia. And they, I've even seen these with two sides so you can get both tonsils at once, which must have been an interesting feat. <laughs> mm, what have we got left? We're closing in on questions. Eighteen twenty glasses. Extendable arms. Flip down sunglasses. The only thing they they didn't figure out for a while was if you curved the if you curved them, you can get them around your ear and they won't fall off. So these have holes in it, where you like the old librarian, you put a ribbon through it and wear it around your neck. Advances came rapidly, but not rapidly enough. Okay, getting to the end. <coughs> This? Yeah. That's a pessary. You hold up all your organs oh. if you happen to be a female. <laughs> I guess it would be hard if you're not a female. I hate to keep that pessary in. Yeah, we'll take it out. The answer to the question is yes, you took them out and cleaned them off every once in a while. And the real answer is the AP repair, which is what the operation is became so easy, it was like a junior resident procedure after a while. And it worked. Okay. If you know what this is, it's my last thing. Don't tell me because I have no other way to close. <laughs> Any idea what that is? It's got what? Probe. Well, this part's a probe. You're half right. This part is for tongue tie. And in a group here where we were senior citizens, pretty much somebody has seen some kid that had a tongue tie operation. Tongue tie was where the little doohickey under your tongue, the frenulum, was so tight you couldn't speak. So, old doc, I saw this once in where Fort Davis, Texas. Old doc who was like 200 years old, was gonna fix the kid's tongue tie after school was out. You put this as a guard around the frenulum and you cut it with a scissor. And apparently it works. The kid I saw it potentially done on 
could speak English okay, but couldn't trill the Spanish verbs. And in that part of Fort Davis, you had to be bilingual. So we had it done. I never got a follow-up, but apparently it worked. Okay, question time. <coughs> Nobody leaves without a couple of good questions. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and make my knees happy. And start. We need an hour's worth of questions to make me at least a little bit content. <laughs> Sir? So sterilization seems so obvious to us now. Uh, when did it finally pick on? Which? Steriliz steriliz sterilization. Uh, there's a relative in the room of Dr. Mystic. That started a decade or, right there. It started a decade or so later. The real impetus was Louis Pasteur who basically saved the French wine industry by killing all the contaminants in French, in French wine. And that did it. Then there was Lister. Uh, then everybody said, what a good idea. These little things we're seeing under the microscope might not be good for you. And that led to it. At Fort Union, I know you're from New Mexico, uh, I went through their records once, and there was an, a thing written in the day report of the chief surgeon said, we got these Lister supplies that are supposed to stop infection. If we get a chance, we'll give them a try. Then a few months later is an article, is a report. They have their carbo carbolic acid machine, which sprays carbolic acid over the operative site. And they're going to give that a try. I assume they worked out. Yeah. But more, more. Sir. If, uh guy was uh, gut shot, was that essentially a death sentence? Yeah. It's that old joke, Doc says you're going to die. Uh, pretty much you could get away with extremities. You might get away with a head injury if it didn't get infected, if you went into the brain. Uh, I've read reports where guys were laying on the battlefield with their guts spilled in the mud for two or three days. Somebody scraped them off and sewed it up and they did okay. But that certainly wasn't the rule. Uh, you would generally die. If you think about it, in the old movies and the old books you've read, nobody, you know, people would say, you shot me and you killed me. <laughs> nobody says that anymore. Because, it, you know, the final uh, word isn't in if you're dead or not until some doctor says you are. <clears throat> but if you had a fatal wound, everybody knew it was a fatal wound. If you happen to be breathing out and you got a chest wound and it didn't hit your lung, it went in one side and out the other, you might survive. They figured out how to do open chest wounds. You put something to obstruct the breathing so you don't get extra air. <coughs> Excuse me. So you don't get extra air in your lungs and die and all that. Good question. You get graded on the questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I've had a really great question. <laughs> Sir, what was the most surprising thing you've learned about Civil War era medical practices? The most surprising thing was that bloodletting actually had a reason. It wasn't a good reason, but it was a reason. If you, in fact, that, that's sort of one of the surgical cliches these days. All bleeding stops and bloodletting lowers the blood pressure. Another question. I've already acknowledged I'm not the smartest guy in the room, so challenge. <laughs> yeah. Did they use maggots much to Absolutely. Clear? Uh, I was an intern at Bellevue, if you know anything about Bellevue in New York. Oh, 2,500 beds, had an insane asylum attached, and the most critical thing about Bellevue was the head of the hospital, guy named Dr. Cutolo, at one of the power outages, read by candlelight that Bellevue had full power. And that says a lot about Bellevue. Because the first thing that happened was the electricity went off, the East River came in and floated out the generators. So Bellevue was that backward a place. <coughs> I forgot your question. What is it? Was asking about maggots. 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 Yes, okay. When I was an intern, we used maggots. We collected the Word got passed on from intern to intern when the when the what used to be called bums, now they're called street people, came in from the gutters with maggots in their wound. If you left them there, yeah. maggots eat all the dead meat. And you mm -hmm. have a beautiful wound in the morning. So we would leave them on. The problem was to kill the maggots, 
they had to use ether. And that was a bit painful. But did they use them in the Civil War? Yes. Well, I don't know so much if they cultivated them or if they left them <coughs> if they found them there. And the next question is leeches. And my practice, as I explained before, I did use leeches once or twice. Good. That's a good question. That's a B plus. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Well, how did you close the gaping wound resulting from an amputation? I've never really quite understood. What Two ways. Uh, one, you just sewed it up, which is not a great idea. Another way, after a while, they decided if you're doing an amputation and you cut the skin in a flap, you can take off the leg and bend it back and put the scar in the back. Another way is to leave it open and about, I think it's a percentage of, <clears throat> a percentage of week it closed and you have a terrible scar that hurt, but at least you have a clean wound as it closed. <clears throat> Nobody thought if you wipe it all off and sew it up, it has a good chance and put a drain in it like you do today. That's a good one. Yeah. Sir? Is there a standard suture material? What would you sew it up with? I'm trying to think what the grade on that question is. I <laughs> think <laughs> <laughs> no one's asked that in a while. Uh, the, the, the suture of preference was silk, braided silk, which you don't use anything braided these days. It came from what used to be called the Orient, I guess now it's called Asia. And <clears throat> that's what you'd use. Confederates, of course, got blockaded. They used cotton for a while. Then they started selling the cotton to the British. When Memphis got captured by the Union, that was their big smuggling port. And they used horse hair. Having grown up in Brooklyn, I didn't realize it was hair from the tail, not from the mane. And the key is you had to boil it to get it supple. And so they used boiled, sterilized stitches to close wounds, which helped. So the answer is silk was preferable, horsehair was a good second, and nowadays you get all kinds of artificial monofilament. It must be, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> That's one of the things you do when you're thinking about a question. <laughs> monofilament was so fine that it was fi there was a 10O, which is finer than a spider's web. And to, to operate on it, you do it through a microscope. After you put a stitch in, you have to wait till it settles down before you put the next stitch in. I guess nowadays they're different, but that's the way it was then. So yeah, horse hair and silk. More, more, more. <laughs> Sir? Well, uh, you're talking about the uh, medical school in Richmond. There was two famous prisons in Richmond also. Living Prison and Belle Isle out in the river. I think Living was for the officers and Belle Isle was for the well, Of course, you want some distinction. Yeah. Was there, a, is that where that medical school, did they have any relationship as far as practicing at those prisons? I don't know. I've seen pictures of the school and it was near that huge cemetery, <coughs> strangely. Uh, which I'm sure the landscape has all changed a lot these days. But it did stay open. And they graduated pretty good doctors. One of which was, oh, I'm going to forget his name, Stonewall Jackson surgeon, uh, Hunter McGuire, who became an AMA president when the war was over. <coughs> and he's the one who didn't kill Stonewall Jackson. <coughs> Stonewall died from having his rib punctured his lung when they dropped him. Hmm. And he got pneumonia and died. Incidentally, in the Confederate Museum and one other museum, I've seen the sets that's at least two that supposedly took off Stonewall Jackson's arm. One of them can't be the right one. <laughs> <coughs> Sir? Uh, we hear a lot from your talk about the wounds. What about diseases uh, that were common at that time? That's <coughs> diseases and infection killed two out of three people that died in the Civil War. Camp diseases with typhus and typhoid, uh, regular old infections, and if a farm boy in the rain knew it was a lot easier to go do your business behind the tent, 
and to go 100 yards to that pole in the, in the other end of the field. <coughs> they also knew you need to take a bath once in a while in the river, regardless of how many cows are upstream from you, and infectious and disease do. Um, I don't think they had any really obscure diseases. I know smallpox, notice how I'm dancing around the question when I don't know the full answer. <laughs> smallpox was essentially more virulent than it is today, and so was chickenpox. And as a matter of fact, I've talked myself into giving you a chickenpox story. Uh, I was looking up in the medical library at UNM, and I found an old medical book in the rare medical book department. As I was going through it, a little glassine packet fell out that had a scab in it. The book was 18, 1864. <coughs> I sent the scab to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, of which I'm a member. They sent it to the CDC, and nobody ever heard anything after that. The presumption was it was a strain of smallpox or chickenpox that might be virile today, that nobody's immune to it. But we never found out. So, did I get around the question pretty well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, try again. Yes? How about uh, burns? I guess that would be more the case in the Confederate or in the Navy, where people would be exposed to some kind of severe fire for the ship as opposed to on land, but in the, any event, how were severe burns treated and were they pretty much legal then? Pretty much. The rule even when I was in training was 50-50-50. 50, 50, 50. 50 years old, 50% 50 burn, you have a 50% chance of living. Mm -hmm. The only organized burn treatment I remember was the Sneeve treatment from 1910. And that was you put the burn patient in running water didn't hurt as much, but you washed all the electrolytes out and the guy died anyway. Oh. I don't think there was an organized treatment back in the Civil War days. But if you invite me back next year, I'll know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that so many times that people have invited me back and I don't know next year. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's a damn good question. I like that one. Did he get an A? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sir? Yeah, um, I don't know if you've read the account of James Garfield's doctors pretty much killed him after he was... Yeah. Is there similar treatments causing many deaths during the Civil War? Well, one, th one thing residents do at midnight over coffee and styrofoam cups is talk about which presidents could be saved and which couldn't. It was pretty obvious Kennedy was dead. His head got blown right. off. It was pretty obvious Lincoln was dead. Because the bullet was inside and it rocked a lot. Rick, Rook, Havoc, Rodney. Yeah. Okay. But Garfield, if everybody kept their damn fingers out of the wound, including Thomas Edison, uh, he had a very survivable wound. McKinley did also, as I recall. <coughs> and, you know, it, it's part of you have to start someplace. And getting Edison's bullet detector in the wound seemed like a good idea at the time. And people died, yeah, it was electronic or something. Oh. And people died slowly in those days. People don't die slowly anymore unless it's a chronic disease, especially from trauma. So a lot of, there's a lot of advances that way. Okay, that's not a good answer, but it's the best one I got. Okay, give your pee. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. So, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, in the Civil War, I think I read the first beginning of a formalized ambulance corps. Absolutely. And how, how did that happen? A plus. <laughs> the first okay. Jonathan Letterman, <laughs> who basically wrote the manual we still use today on battlefield surgery. A couple of changes here and there. <coughs> He decided, first of all, the ambulances belong to the doctors, not the quartermasters. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't say, I'm a colonel, I want the ambulance to haul my whiskey away. And you had to get it through. There was an officer in your squadron or battalion who was in charge for the doctor of the ambulances. The original ones were called avalanches. 
they had one axle, and when they stopped short, the soldier fell out. <laughs> and then somebody figured, well, four wheels might be a good idea. Uh, and that was a little better. Then figured four wheels with two tiers to hold stretchers was a good idea. <coughs> Ambulance trains had the whole car had all up and down its length, three tiers of stretchers you could put in there, and it did it. And then we got, you know, to today's ambulances and all. And after they got off from horses, droppings getting spread into the ambulance, things got better. You ready for an ambulance story? Yeah. If you have to read one Civil War book that nobody knows about, you want to read General Imboden's description of taking the Confederate wounded from Gettysburg back to Virginia. Imboden, I-M-B-O-D-E-N. It's really worthwhile. Uh, it was a 17-mile caravan in a dark and stormy night thunderstorm with kids sneaking out of their houses, putting sticks in the wheels to overturn the ambulances. He threatened to shoot a couple of them. It's unclear if he ever did or not. At one point, they were attacked by cavalry, not knowing it was a medical caravan. And a lot of the soldiers hadn't had food or their wounds changed in days and it was 17 miles long and they finally got back to Virginia. It's, it's heart rendering even 100 some odd, 150 some odd years later. Sir? Uh, can you talk about Claire Barton and uh, the Red Cross, that aspect? Claire Barton was a clerk in the uh, patent office. She being a forceful woman talked her fellow clerk into working for half her salary to do her job. She then went and inflicted herself, which is, I don't know if it's ever been called that, but it was, on different headquarters, um, including at Antietam, there's a basement where she worked, and she would sort of order the generals around. She was about five feet tall. <laughs> <coughs> she would order the generals around, she would do her stuff and disappear on her deathbed, so she was a good nurse. Eventually she founded the American Red Cross, but had personality conflicts with people, and they sort of tried to get her out of it as quick as they could. <coughs> but I don't know if that worked or not. Uh, do you recall her most important life's work that she said on her deathbed? She found a clerk from Andersonville, who at the risk of his own life kept a double set of books with the names of all the soldiers. And she and he went down to the cemetery and I think identified 1,600 bodies, uh, which you know put closure on a lot of things. She also established the Missing Soldiers Bureau in DC in a, in a house that's close to Mary Surratt's house in that part of town. And people kept writing her, where's my son, my uncle, whatever. The National Museum of Civil War Medicine runs the Clara Barton House. The story of that is there the General Services Admission was going to tear it down, and literally one of the inspectors got hit on the head in the garret by a sign. And the sign said, Missing Soldiers Bureau. One thing led to another, and the National Museum has restored that building. They give talks and all that there. Interestingly, the light bulbs in it that had electricity were basically 40 watt light bulbs. And that's what electricity was back in the day. But I would go there if I were you in Washington. Didn't they also discover a bunch of records or something in the ceiling? Lots of stuff. Like that? Last time I was yeah. there, they hadn't quite explored the, the garret. Hmm. But they found records, they found a, a hoop from a frontline ambulance, and a bunch of other stuff. It's amazing, and it was going to be closed just by good luck. That guy hadn't gotten hit in the head with a sign. <laughs> now, she, she being five foot tall, this is a third floor walk up, the stair rises were about that high. And luckily, there's an elevator or I couldn't have made it. And she just got too old to go up three floors of stairs that high and had to abandon it. No one ever said if she ever got her old job back at the patent bureau. <laughs> but she might have. Oh, that's, yeah, you have to see that if you're in DC. You also, in one of the, the Saturday tours from the museum, uh, I forgot the name of it, but there's a battlefield park 
where Lincoln stood up to get a better view. And someone said, I don't care if you're president or not, get your head down or it'll be shot off. In nicer terms. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of hidden stuff in DC. More questions? Sir. Well, yeah. What was the cleanup process like after a battle? Um, bodies and That's worth an A plus. <laughs> cleanup procedures, not very good. And I know that if you, the second battle of Manassas, they camped where the bodies were kind of washing up from the first battle of Manassas. And the same thing in the wilderness and stuff like that. And they would get slaves, or contraband as they were called when they deserted to the Union, to sort of try to move all the bodies out so the guys could pitch their tent. They were terrible. And even these days in the wilderness, which is outside of Fredericksburg, Mm -hmm. uh, they still keep finding artifacts and bodies and soldiers that burned to death and all that stuff. So it was terrible. I like that. Yeah. How much of a triage system did they have then? Good question. And then tied into that, if a person was you know, not going to be treated, would they give them anything to help relieve the pain or uh, were they too... Uh, short of the chloroform or I mean, I guess I didn't give chloroform to guys that were just dying that I believe the Yes, and up to the second part. The first part, Jonathan Letterman invented triage. Civilian triage is if you have a bus accident with a lot of people, uh, you take care of the sickest first, etc., etc. Military triage was you put aside the severest injury, you put aside the lightest injury, and you work on the middle class. The idea being to save as many people as you can, <coughs> and surgery might make a difference. <coughs> the severely wounded guys, they tried to make comfortable. That's where that great whiskey. If they had some high, high class drugs, they might give them to them. But and if at the end of the day, or the days, if they had some leftover pizzazz, they'd try to operate on the severely wounded ones. The theory was the lightly wounded guys would get better on them by themselves or under the care of their buddies. So yes, Jonathan Letterman never got to be more than a major, deserved to be surgeon general. Uh, he was kind of irascible too, but they, they didn't promote him much. That's a good question. That's, that's another A plus one. <laughs> yeah. Top that, somebody. <laughs> no one's asked how much this set cost. How does that set cost? <laughs> Shouldn't have to promise you, Dan. Okay, when I, another story. When I was a kid in Long Island, I always wanted a Civil War surgeon set for some perverted reason. <laughs> you were a weird bucks. kid. <laughs> Where the hell is a kid going to get $50 back in the day? As I got older and wiser and knew a little more about the Civil War, my second wife, and I always say still my good friend, knew I wanted a Civil War set, and for my 50th birthday, which is quite a while ago, she got me that set. Paid $1,800 to an Albuquerque anesthesiologist, Civil War anesthesiologist family. The question is, why would they give up a fifth generation Civil War set? And the answer is, my second wife is a charming lady. <laughs> and she got it and paid 1800 for it. And now, at the height of its value, it was probably about 10 grand. But having used it so much, the, the brilliant purple uh, velvet has changed into a crappy gray, and it's probably lost some value. But I would think it's probably worth eight grand. It's different than the run of the mill sets, which had only two layers. And there is at least 15,000 of those around somewhere. This has an extra layer. It was, it was owned by a contract surgeon. He got a uniform and a paycheck, was technically not in the Army, and had a supply of his own instruments. So it's a little cut above that. I like that one. Okay. <laughs> Come on, top that. Sir. We know that the soldiers were not fighting all the time. And uh, they also had camp followers and things like that. So could you discuss the venereal or sexually transmitted disease issue. Correct. General Hooker. Good question. It's not Hooker. The Hookers were called Hookers before General Hooker. 
Um, good question. That subject is called the subject the soldiers never talked about. And every place, Washington, D.C. had an unbelievable amount of houses of ill repute. And if you're a soldier, you had to take your $13 and spend it somewhere. And prostitution really got going. There are classes of prostitutes. There are the street walkers, which are the cheapest and the most diseased and the least desirable. There are the ones that had cribs, which are a little cut above, and that would be a prostitute who's sort of fallen on hard times, but she can still maybe entice somebody in. And they were pretty much diseases. They're the group that committed the most suicides, uh, usually with opium. Then there were the high-class call girls. I don't think they were called call girls. That lived in the houses. They had a madam. They had a piano player. They had a bar. They were dressed well, and they were the most expensive. They were generally for senior officers or senators or government people or something. Speaking of which, we won't go into that. <laughs> uh, it was, it, I won't say it's a cottage industry, but it's a huge industry. What did all the slaves that were freed and had to be at the mercy of the army they were marching behind, what did the ladies do? Uh, a lot of them turned to remunerative procedures for <laughs> food or whatever, and they were prostitutes too. It's the second oldest largest profession outside of lawyers. <laughs> it was an unbelievable problem because everybody got sick. There was no treat. The, the cliche was one night with Venus, the rest of your life with Mercury. Because <laughs> Mercury was theoretically the treatment for syphilis, probably not. The way you treated venereal disease, uh, well, take syphilis for example. It's got three stages. First stage, you get a sore spot, almost anywhere on the body, but usually on the genitals. And whatever you do, it goes away in two weeks. So you think you're cured. In the meantime, it's nibbling at your brain and spinal cord and nerves and all that. Sooner or later, you get secondary syphilis, and eventually you get paralyzed, blind, and die. And till the Tuskegee experiment, sadly, there was no real way to treat syphilis. It was a cost of many poor black students at Tuskegee that found the value of penicillin. Yeah, did I answer it? I don't know. Well, uh, to put it in perspective, like compared to the number of pneumonia deaths or the number of troops that were down with syphilis compared to other diseases that he was, do you have any idea as to you said it was a huge problem, but did it uh, compare to the other ailments that they... I think it must, although I don't think it was reported. Oh. Because you don't want to name names when you've got officers and congressmen and all that stuff. It's a good question. Yeah, oh, I tell you a Vietnam story? Sure. <laughs> Anybody that wants to leave, you can't. The doors are locked. <laughs> in Vietnam, the squadron surgeon was responsible for identifying the, the Vietnamese laundry workers, which was Vietnamese for hooker, I think. And if you got syphilis or gonorrhea, you went to the MP's office and had to go through the picture book and look at the pictures to identify the girl. My medics, being terribly clever, used that as a catalog. <laughs> and they went to the MP's office, said they had gonorrhea, and picked out the good girls and the good laundries. The Vietnamese word for, for prostitute had to be laundry worker. Anybody that's been there, because all these laundries, I'll take the laundry, I'll take the laundry, Doc. And that's the reason why. Okay, another one. What about cell stock? I like that one. You, you've done your homework, man. <laughs> shell shock was called act like a man, and you got slapped in the face. Uh, man up, in First World War, it was shell shock. Second World War, it was battle fatigue, and now it's PTSD or something like that. 
And you remember Patton, the best general in the army, slapped a soldier and got sent to England to raise a false army. <laughs> but now it's, I'm, I'm a member of the Vietnam Veterans of America. Somehow all those guys got older. We used to be 25. <laughs> and pretty much a third of them is getting some kind of payment from the VA for PTSD. And many of them had no idea they had it. They just read or whatever. So it's getting well noted these days. <clears throat> but during the Civil War, it's just... Civil War, you read the Red Badge of Courage. Mm -hmm. <coughs> guy got wounded, and so it made him a hero, even though he ran away. In the Civil War, it was act like a man. And the peer pressure was such that nobody knew where Canada was. Mm. And you char you charge the other side knowing a third of you are gonna die. And you fought, well, I guess all wars, I know in Vietnam, you fought for your buddy, you didn't fight for the cause. And it would be too embarrassing not not to take the take the bullet. And there was very little uh, acknowledged mental diseases. In fact, in the Revolutionary War, to go back another war. The British Army was definitely bad form if you ducked when a cannonball came your way. <laughs> and especially if you put your foot out to stop it, because it would blow your foot off. So things have changed. Yeah. More questions? It's starting to get warmed up. One well-known uh, Civil War doctor was Dr. Mary Walker, uh, the only female Medal of Honor recipient. And uh, what, what can you tell us about her? Mary Walker, for the rest of her life, wore men's clothing. She was probably a decent doctor. She was a big Planned Parenthood kind of advocate. She wouldn't give her medal back in 1914 when they reviewed them all and decided who didn't deserve one. And she always wore men's clothing. And she was sort of nuts, but you know, that's <laughs> not a big deal. Yeah. Oh, and she was indeed the first female. I think she entered the army as a man. I'm not sure. But I know she fought for the medal for a while. And yes, you're correct. Nobody wins a medal of honor. You receive it or you're awarded it. And I've met three or four medal of honor recipients. And they said the thing that pisses them off the most is when somebody calls a medal of honor winners. Yeah. Because it ain't no competition. <coughs> yeah? Whenever uh, the prisoners were brought in that were wounded, did they uh, receive pretty much equal treatment? I'm not talking about once they got into the prison camp, but you know, the, today's army and military like to say, well, we don't care if it's an enemy or if it's, you know, good guy, we just want to try to treat him and help him. Right. But how did the Civil War doctors treat the enemy, if you will, at the battlefield? Number one, everybody was an American. Right. And they had a lot going for them. Mm -hmm. And what would happen usually is all the doctors would get together on both sides, treat all the wounded under triage uh, rules, the trouble was at the end of that, if you were on the losing side, you might become a prisoner of war. Hunter McGuire, Hunter Holmes McGuire, said Stonewall, we didn't call him Stonewall, probably said, sir, <laughs> we got all these Yankee docks, what should we do with them? And Jackson said, give them back, maybe they'll give ours back. And that caught on and doctors became non-combatants. Eventually worked for clergymen, never worked for lawyers. <laughs> Some doctors insisted on going to places like Andersonville to follow their wounded. And they're heroes in my estimation. But that's how that worked. There was an honor, you know, except for being so damn brutal, it was a pretty honorable war. You saw horse soldiers, I'm sure. And at the end, the, the Confederate colonel. Um, asks John Wayne's surgeon, who was that? Um, William, William Holden. William Holden. Yeah. He said, could my surgeon be of assistance to you? And that's the way it went. They were gentlemen, especially the Southerners. They didn't rape and pillage quite as much as the Northerners did. 
Because the northern, the northerners weren't actually quality people like the southerners were. Of <laughs> More questions. I grew up in Brooklyn, so I'm impartial. <laughs> <laughs> More questions. Speaking of that movie, the guy had gangrene. And William Horner was going to amputate his. No, said he could cure it if that. Three months. Could it? Would it have cured it? If it were penicillin, it could have. Oh. It might have. Now, from that movie also, we had a talk at one of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine meetings about reality in Hollywood. No one has ever figured out what those damn kettles of boiling water were all about. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured, when I get to be a doctor, I'll learn it. But no one ever said, give me hot water. And also, William Holden looks good in a white coat. The Civil War docs never wore white coats. They wore aprons. He wasn't a Civil War doctor. He was a Civil War. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. He was a Yankee doctor. Right. Well, no, no doc. Well, all the doctors were sort of trained the same. Oh. In fact, that's why William Holden would know if he had to leave his wounded, they'd get decent treatment by the Confederates. Because everybody was in America. And nobody hated the common soldier. They hated the cause and the secessionists and the Yankees. But, you know, the guy next door to you <coughs> is American. What can you do? It's like if you saw a band of brothers, everybody's seen mm -hmm. it. At the end, one of the 101st Airborne guys said, the soldiers we fought were just like us. If circumstances were different, we'd be buddies, we'd go hunting together, we'd go fishing. But it turned out they were the enemy, and we had to kill them, so we did what we had to do. Yeah, more, more, more. Come on. <laughs> you want to go out in the heat? Yeah. I guess that the uh, wounds from the sabers during cavalry charges, or maybe from bayonets during bayonet charges, those were probably pretty good ones to get because you didn't have all this that the mini ball right? Yes and no. The most, the best function of bayonets was candle holders. You drive them in the ground and put a handle, a candle in the handle. But he said that. <laughs> Only two percent at the most of, of deaths were caused by bayonets. Most soldiers threw them away. They were heavy. They screwed up the level of the. Uh, what do I want to say? The lever of the, the rifle. The balance. The balance. Yeah. The balance. yeah. Uh, cavalry sabers, most of the time, weren't sharp. They weren't made to run through. Because the last thing you want is driving on your horse. Can you drive a horse? <laughs> Running on your horse, <laughs> spearing somebody, and having shish kebab to go down. <laughs> <laughs> and that would incapacitate you. They were made to chop down. That's why a lot of the wounds were skull wounds, as you pointed out. Uh, they were dull. They would break skulls, they would cause hematomas, and they would do, and they would break shoulders and, clab and collarbones especially with the side of them. But I have seen, and you might have too, the cavalry tactics of the time, and nowhere is it mentioned that you're supposed to run through guys. Your sword rallies people, you stick your hat on it, you know you're an officer, and you chop down from your horse. First of all, if you're on the horse, it's hard to get down to the level of a four foot six guy or five foot two guy and pierce him in the chest. I like that question. Yeah. You should write, I should, is somebody recording all this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did I get a copy somehow? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. So the Gatling gun was invented by a doctor to save lives? Dr. Gatling, it was to save lives. Yeah. The idea was it was a painless way to kill people. Same thing with the guillotine. The doctor figured that's a painless way to kill people, and it's really humane. Mm -hmm. Except the French and other people decided they didn't want to be humane, and occasionally you put somebody with their head facing up <laughs> on the guillotine. <laughs> and that took the humanity out of it all. I guess so. <laughs> Good question. Was the Gavin gun used frequently? Or? Oh, it was generally considered a nuisance. Because it was crew served, and you had to keep loading it. I don't know what a magazine holds, but I think you had to keep changing them frequently. In fact, Custer refused to take his Gatling gun along, like the little big horn, because it, 
God, there was a man I mean, that got in the way and all that sort of stuff. <coughs> Incidentally, if you, when I moved to Santa Fe, I went into a bookstore and said, do you have any books on the Little Bighorn? Because I thought everybody was killed. And the guy said, uh-huh. There were hundreds of people that didn't get killed, and they were the Indians. And at one time, <laughs> at one time True. some commission from Washington <laughs> decided it was valuable to find out who killed Custer. And so the reigning chiefs got together, picked the most honored chief, and told the government he was the one that killed Custer. <laughs> and he got a medal and a certificate and all that. And apparently Custer, Custer died in the first 10 minutes down by the river and never got to look like the, the thing that hung in the back bars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never got a chance to retreat to Custer Hill and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, good. That's another anecdote. <laughs> more and more, yeah. Grape shop. Did you talk about how that affected you know, the medical aspects? There was grape and there was canister, which is basically the size of the balls. And if you get, if you were, I want to say foolish, but they weren't foolish, they charged. And if you charged and got grape shot or, or uh, what was the other one? Was? Canister. Canister. You disappeared. Not only did you disappear, but everybody in a swarth is almost as wide as a platoon disappeared. <laughs> And there was no treating it, because they were gone. I imagine treating a grape shot, if you were sort of at the periphery and got shot once, was like a mini ball or something. But yeah, there's a place in Kennesaw Mountain where a Union platoon was going over a hill, didn't realize on the other side of the hill was an artillery unit of Confederates, who just fired grape shot into them as they came over the hill at maybe 20 foot distance, and they just vaporized. Wow. Yeah, lots, lots of ways to get killed. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what grape shot or canister is. I okay, you take a shell, mm -hmm. and it's like a shotgun shell, except you fill it with things that big. Mm -hmm. I used to know how many count goes in there. Mm -hmm. And it's like shooting with a very powerful shotgun. And there's so many of them, you can't get away from getting wounded every couple of inches. And it's called grape shot because they look like grapes. Sir? Um, with the colored regiments, like the 54th Massachusetts, uh, what sort of medical attention or uh, provisions for, for caring for colored troops uh, were there? Did they have white? Doctors, uh, or black doctors, or what was the situation? Well, the, the 54th was from Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so their officers on board were civilized. And all the officers were white, partly because, and in the Boston unit, it didn't necessarily count, partly because the, the former slaves couldn't read or write, and they needed white officers to do the paperwork. Uh, they had a white doctor whose name I forgot. Incidentally, I met the colonel's direct descendant once at Pecos. Cool guy. Uh, the colored troops generally had surgeons sort of equivalent to the Navy surgeons, who were mostly drunk and were mostly off duty and did the best they could, but it wasn't very good. If you were in the medical school class or whatever and you were number 57, you didn't get the assignment number two and three guy. So generally, sort of not by design, it was pretty crummy. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. In the Navy, you had to wait till the other office, till the other doctor died, because it was such a coveted position in the Navy doc. Sort of like nursing homes <laughs> these days. More, 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 more. <laughs> There's people here who'll never get out because they haven't asked a question. Phantom limb syndrome, is that a real thing? Phantom limb? Absolutely. Does it matter? Does it change? Is it more severe or less severe based upon how it's amputated? Not really. Uh, repeat the question, oh. please. Repeat the question. Yeah, what about phantom limbs? 
and Weir, his last name was Weir, uh, he had a special hospital to work on phantom, limb, phantom limbs in the Civil War. And what it is is basically your nerves don't know there's not a further extension. Weir Mitchell was his name. He became famous. Uh, and even today, I think they're hard to treat. When I had my knee replaced and was on home rehab, the rehab nurse said she's had patients who wake up in the middle of the night and fall flat on their ass. Because they still think their missing leg is there. Yeah. And you have to remember it's not there and you have to put it back on. So phantom limb is a real problem. That's a good question. No one's asked that in quite a while. Maybe forever. <laughs> <laughs> so on your way out, sign your name so I can use you as a reference. <laughs> <laughs> more and more, sir. Is there a good museum down in Pecos then? I've been to Jim Gordon's. Museum, shall we say? Isn't is there amazing? Hmm? Isn't his museum amazing? Oh uh, yes. He's got every famous person who's heard of at least one weapon from that. Cochise, Indians, all kinds of people. He's been trying to get that to be taken over by the state, but they frankly can't afford it because everything is super priceless. Wow. Where is that? All right. So uh, in Pecos. You almost have to be blindfolded to go to his house to find it. Yeah. <laughs> and I've only been there once, and I don't remember where it is. Um, but the Glorietta, say? but you've got the Glorietta Park down there. Is there a yes. museum that Glorietta and Not Vegas? really. We, we, were try we were trying when I left, two years now, I guess, to put that big 1930s house there to make that into a museum. I'm not sure what happened. Interesting story, now that you mention it. Uh, Kit Carson, have you ever read Blood and Thunder? Kit Carson ordered a Hawken rifle and picked it up 10 years later in New York. And I know where the Hawken rifle is. It's in the Masonic Temple, off the, off the, to the side of the big Milka Magnesia building, which is a Masonic building. And if you know somebody, they'll let you in the big safe where Kit Carson's rifle is. He must have been a little guy. The shoulder part hardly fits in my shoulder, and it's only about that tall. And they say the last person to fire around through that was Kit Carson. Now, there are several Hawken rifles, and at the museum, he's got the rest of them. It's an amazing facility. Yeah. Good. More and more. Medical <laughs> waste. Yeah. Okay, as they had all of these severed limbs that they... You better than What? Oh. You had a low-ranking guy, if you uh, did your amputations inside of a house, you throw them out the window so you wouldn't trip over them. And some kind of low-ranking orderly would dig a pit and bury them. And he'd still be moving, because they didn't know they weren't still connected. And at every place like Shiloh, every place they say that's a hospital, if you knew how, you'd look for the pits with the amputated limbs. At Pecos, we know where the hospital was. And we once had a, a body dowser. I had no idea there were such things. <laughs> Come and go, well, here, 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 here's a pit with the bones in it. We never got a grant to dig it up. But <clears throat> yeah, sir. Um, a few years ago, you're probably aware of this, uh, there was a, an effort to uh, locate the uh, dead at Glorietta that weren't identified, that were just buried, you know, outside the hospital and, and wherever. I was a part of a group that went down there. We had cadaver dogs that uh, two men brought from Denver down there, and the dogs were amazing because they were able, after 150 years, to identify where a body was buried under the ground. 1987. It was more like six years ago, I want to say. Oh, really? And uh, we were, what we were trying to do uh, was to get permission once we identified where the uh, bodies were buried to uh, get them uh, removed from, from the ground and then uh, buried with honors at the Santa Fe Cemetery. Uh, we never did get permission to do that, but we did identify 
where there were probably uh, 10 to 15 uh, bodies uh, buried. And uh, But it was amazing to see the cadaver dogs at work. Oh, uh, that's there, In fact, there was there's that one uh, near Pigeon's Ranch is that little log cabin, shell of a cabin. And one of the dogs went over and started going nuts at the cabin. And mm -hmm. what we apparently um, discovered was that some of the dirt and mud that was used to build the cabin came from uh, near one of the graves, and the dog was... If it's the cabin I'm thinking of, there were 35 Confederates there. I'm sorry? There were 35 Confederates there. It was mismarked on the paperwork. Well, it's, it's across the, the right. Santa Fe Trail from that, uh, that house where they found the Confederates now, back the in the evening. The story I heard is the guy was digging a foundation for his garage. Yeah, yeah. And the moral of the story is never discover anything digging a foundation for your garage. <laughs> <laughs> it took years. And they had the company clerk that still had his pen and pencil in his pocket, a couple of wedding rings they identified, mm -hmm. and Shropshire, because he still had fragments of his dirty red shirt. Right. And he's back in Kentucky. And it was, and they're buried in a mass grave, as you said, at the National Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. You're standing up for a reason. Yeah. For a reason. Yeah. So, so just like the Academy Awards, this portion of the <laughs> presentation, uh, we need to <coughs> conclude. Uh, but just one more question, anybody have? Okay. So I want to thank all of you for coming. I especially want to thank Dr. Mellon for a wonderful presentation. And before, <laughs> Challenge coins Great. from the museum. Thank, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. It's wonderful. We did. It's the way old guys have fun. Yeah. <laughs> now that doesn't that doesn't. Mean